again to Off the Page. I'm Leslie Choice. My guest today is John Kirk. He's a professor of Latin American studies and the author of numerous books about Cuba and Central America. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you, Leslie. Um, Cuba's had this, this difficult, unique position as a nation. I wonder if you could explain a bit of the, the chemistry that's made that so. Well, Cuba has been the victim of three uh, cycles of dependency. First of all, from the uh, late 1490s, uh, until 1898, it was a colony of Spain, and uh, it was its function was to provide uh, sugar uh, to Spain and to act as a staging point for the the fleet that was looking for gold going back to Spain. And then it became a colony or a neo colony of the United States from uh, the late 1890s until 1959. Uh, the United States intervened several times to make or break presidencies, and it was only it's only 90 miles away. Um, so geographically, it was very it lent itself to that. And then after the, uh, the Castro Revolution, uh, then the Soviet Union became the, the main backer. And until 1990, so from 1962 to 1990, it too was the, was the main source of, of political influence, of, of, of a model, of ideology. Uh, and as a trading partner, so 85% of Cuba's trade was with the, the Eastern Bloc. So, so it's a very unusual mixture, yes. but three, three cycles then. Yeah. And therein lies that conflict that's been with us for a long time with the United States, of course. Sure. Well, as a matter Russian of fact, the, you know, from the 1820s, the whole concept of manifest destiny, people talked about Cuba being in the 1820s. So we're talking about you know, 180 years ago, a ripe apple about to drop into the United States. Uh, it was manifest destiny that Cuba should become part. And you know, this was at a time when the United States was buying Florida and then, and then sort of expanding west, uh, the eight, mid 1840s, when half of Mexico was annexed by the United States. So Cuba was seen as being the, you know, a logical extension. And again, it's and that didn't happen. So they're, they're ticked off. Now, you go to Cuba often, you've been there 50 times. Yeah. Tell, me, tell me what you see when you go to Havana today. Um, I, I started going to Havana in 1976. That was the first time I went, and I go back roughly about twice a year. Um, Havana is a city which, as everyone says, is, is, is run down, basically because the C Cuban Revolution decided uh, in 1959 that the resources, limited resources, should be put where they were needed, and that was outside the city. Uh, so in the countryside, if you want to see development, you go and that's where yes. you should go. Uh, it's also a city where UNESCO has put a lot of money into Old Havana, so that's expanding dramatically. Because about a third of all tourists who go to Cuba, and that's two million people this year, go to Havana. So the colonial part is being restored, I think, very well. Um, and, and basically, I, I sort of wander around the university, wander around talking with diplomats, with business people, and, and uh, just getting an idea, a feel for how the thing's going. People happy, healthy on the street? Yeah, I think it's important to bear in mind that 10% of the population have voted with their feet and are, are living in, 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 in gilded exile in Miami. Yes, um, and those are a lot of folks with the money. Uh, well, the, the, the Bacardi family sort of in many ways are the, are the creme de la creme in financial terms of the people of that generation who left. Um, most people I, I've met uh, are very open, politically uh, very, very savvy. Um, I think that they are fully aware of the track record of the United States, very critical in many ways of their government, but at the same time very nationalistic. And I think they've seen radical changes. You know, the uh, logic would have dictated that after the main financial back of the Soviet Union pulled out, that Cuba would have been toast. It wasn't. And part of the reason was that people have a, a, a sort of a national project to pull together to, to protect the, what they have. Is Castro still a, the beloved leader? Um, I think that the, the popularity of Fidel Castro has, has dropped. Um, particularly among younger people, but I, I have no doubt that if there were an election Canadian style tomorrow, uh, he would be elected by an, an overwhelming majority of the population. So I'd say he's st still very popular. I'd say that uh, he is seen as the grandfather of the nation, a bit like Nelson Mandela, but even more so yeah. in Cuba, basically because he's the first Cuban president to stand up to the United States and say, no, we, we refuse to, to buckle down. We're going to do our own thing. And I think that, that uh, appeals to the nationalism of Cubans. 
course, uh, American politicians, when they, they want to ostracize and criticize Cuba, they'll say, well, Castro is this leader, but there are no free elections there. Well, there are elections, there are ele and, and Castro has been uh, elected. Uh, there's one party, so, uh, but I would argue that in many countries of Central America where you've got many parties, th that does not mean necessarily democracy. And you know, the case of Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador, the countries which have had elections uh, in the 1970s and 80s, um, I would argue they were ext extraordinarily undemocratic. Yet elections took place with a number of parties. So I think that democracy needs to be defined more, 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 more broadly than just having elections. Yes. Now, you've written extensively about the relationship between the Catholic Church and the government in Cuba. Right. Perhaps you could explain a bit about how that works there. Sure. The, the Catholic Church before the revolution uh, was extremely powerful, as it is in all of Latin American societies. It was, the, I would argue that Cuba was the least Catholic country of all of Latin America before the revolution, but still had a lot of political clout. Um, the Catholic Church before the revolution, and this of course is before the Second Vatican Council, 1962 to 65, the Cuban Revolution took place in 1959. So you had a, a, a very conservative church that was largely uh, run by uh, Spanish priests, largely in the cities, largely catering to the urban middle class, and largely getting its money from private, private schools. The Castro brothers are a very good example. Both of them went to private schools. Fidel went to the, uh, the most prestigious uh, Catholic, private Catholic school, uh, Jesuit uh, school um, in Havana. And I think that when the revolution came, one of the first things that the government did is to say, we are a revolutionary society. And what we mean by that is that we have to level the playing field. And so it's, it is unchristian uh, to have um, a, a number of people, the, the elite being trained in these fabulous schools, when 24% of the population is illiterate in the countryside, 50%. So what we're going to do, we're going to privatize uh, our, uh, all schools, uh, we're going to, sorry, we're going to nationalize all schools. Yes. The private schools uh, are going to, uh, to, be, to be closed and we're going to, to sort of send out the university students and the teachers uh, out to the boonies to teach people to read and write massive literacy campaign, which reduced literacy down to 3%. Um, this upset the Catholic Church. And so from the, from the, from the 1959 until the mid-1960s, the Catholic Church became, in many ways, the de facto opposition to the Cuban government uh, in Cuba. Has that been resolved? To okay. a large extent, yes. But, but I think that that's, it's been resolved because the Catholic Church has changed dramatically. You know, if you think back to, to, to pre-Vatican II times, uh, the Catholic Church was extraordinarily traditional, uh, that it had not changed in centuries. I think the Catholic Church has, has changed quite dramatically, particularly under the, uh, the, during the papacy of John, Pope John XXIII and, and his successor, Pope Paul VI. So the Catholic Church had this aggiornamento, this coming to modernizing and coming to terms. Um, and I think that had its impact throughout Latin America. And in Latin America in 1968, uh, the Latin American bishops in Medellin in Colombia said, you know, uh, we've got to change. Um, so then you have a generation of bishops, such as uh, Archbishop Rom Romero from El Salvador, um, who, who then become practitioners of liberation theology and basically do a U-turn theologically on, on, the, uh, uh, on what the church had been. We have this preferential option for the poor. Well, oh, that's what Castro was trying to do, was showing a preferential option for the poor. So in many ways, from the mid-1960s, the Catholic Church comes uh, online and becomes up to date with the pressing pop, uh, problems of Latin America. Yeah, that's a fascinating intermingling of the politics and the church together. I want to go back to um, another historical figure in Cuba, Jose Marti, uh, who I'm a Canadian, I know very little about him. If I went to Cuba, everyone would know who this man was, uh, a poet, uh, a mystic, a political thinker. Uh, tell me a little bit about who he was. Jose Martí was born in 1853 and died in 1895. Um, I did my, my PhD thesis at UBC on Martí's thought and I read the complete works, so all 27 volumes of them. Uh, I, I was very influenced by Martí and, and have tremendous veneration for him. Um, the Castro Revolution, when it started, when Fidel Castro was arrested in 1953, he was asked, who put you up to this? And he said, Jose Martí is the intellectual author. When he was in jail, he asked for the books to defend himself because Castro is a lawyer, has a doctorate in law, and wanted to be able to refer to Martí. His books were prohibited him. Um, Castro has used quotations from Jose Martí uh, frequently and knows him very, very well. When you arrive at the airport in Havana, you arrive at the Jose Martí International Airport. When Fidel Castro gives his speeches, it's at the Jose Martí Plaza de la Revolución. The National Library is the Biblioteca Nacional Jose Martí. The one peso bill has, guess who? 
So Marti is extremely it's important. Everywhere. Yeah. And, and, and uh, every school in Cuba has to have a bust of Martí next to the Cuban flag in front of it. So Martí is, th think of um, Mao Zedong in China multiplied by a factor of 50, or Abraham Lincoln by a factor of 100, uh, to get a sense of the importance of Martí. But someone who wrote poetry. And it, uh, Guantanamera, the song yes. by Pete Seeger, c it well. comes from the poetry. Wonderful poet. Uh, and the person who was the originator of one of Latin America's first original movements uh, in, in culture called Modernismo, uh, Martí. And what was the, the mystical side? Martí uh, was a person who believed in duty, in obligation, in, uh, in mysticism. Um, and as a result, he, uh, he also believed in a very practical form of religion. Uh, he was a mason. Uh, he believed, uh, however, that the, the role of the church was to, and he used the ex example of the Salvation Army, to take the bottles out of people's mouths and to be with them. That was the duty. That was, the, that was what separated us from the beasts. Yeah. Uh, and uh, because of his the sense of duty, obligation, his exceptional nationalism, you know, he was killed fighting against the Spanish, shot down, fought, you know, leading a charge against the Spanish. This, was, this, was, this appealed to, to Cubans and still does. So he's a, he's a bit of a cult figure today. Oh, still very, very much so, still extraordinarily important. Both, on both sides, the Straits of Florida, because in Miami, he's revered as well as in Cuba. It's just that you get selective indignation when people take certain parts of his work in Miami and, and emphasize it, as opposed to looking at the big picture. That's right. Uh, well, poets are open to that kind of interpretation, yes, for sure. Right. Um, back to Canada and the present here for a minute. Canada has a very unique and different relationship with Cuba compared to the United States. H how has that come into being? Well, I think that Canada, uh, as, an, as an honest broker, has, has basically believes that uh, Cuba is a country with which we have a very different political system, uh, but nevertheless, uh, I, we should have a good working relationship. Um, Castro and uh, the Castro government never uh, caused too many problems for, Cuba, for Canada. In fact, it gave um, ca Canadians preferential treatment when they nationalized property. The Bank of Nova Scotia and the Royal Bank, for instance, were, were kept open while American banks were being nationalized. America, uh, Canadian uh, investors in Cuba got their money back, whereas Americans lost out. So the, the Castro government played very intelligently the Canadian card. And the time that he was, uh, the revolution took place, John Diefenbaker was the, was the prime minister. And Diefenbaker, too, was a nationalist with a very difficult, thorny relationship with, uh, with John F. Kennedy. Uh, so it started off well, and then the Trudeau uh, era was particularly important and very, uh, very significant from the point of view of development of trade relationships and the good personal relationship. And you may recall that Castro came for Trudeau's funeral, um, so many years later that relationship continued. Yeah, that was very striking, actually, to, to notice that on television when that was uh, being shown here. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what kinds of things we have in common. I remember that old National Film Board documentary of Joey Smallwood from Newfoundland going down, trying to meet up with uh, Castro there and thinking, well, you know, what, what are the linkages there? Fish, I right. suppose, to begin with. But, yeah. but what else do we have in common with Cubans? Well, well d d don't under underestimate the fish connection, because if you go mm -hmm. to the Lunenburg Fisheries Museum, you'll see all the stencils for the boxes uh, of salt cod that w went down. I think that uh, we have a normal relationship. It's not a particularly cordial one. It's a normal one. We disagree on things, but we, we, we keep things going. The, the main reason, tourism at the moment. Um, 380,000 Canadians will go to Cuba this year. It's uh, a little bit warmer than here. A lot warmer, that's right. Um, we're, the, we're the number one source of tourism. We're the number two or three, depending upon who, how you interpret the, the statistics, trading partner of Cuba. Um, we're the number two foreign investor in Cuba. Um, we have tremendous links with universities backwards and forwards. Uh, we have a powerful um, uh, neighbor in the middle, and, and it, it, it's very often to the Canadian government's interest to illustrate its independent foreign policy by dealing with, with Cuba. So we, dist we distinguish ourselves from, uh, from the United States by how different we are from them, uh, health care, possession of guns, and our treatment of Cuba. So it, it's, of, it's of strategic and tactical importance to most Canadian governments uh, to show that they are different from the United States in their policy towards Cuba. Americans still not uh, technically allowed to travel to, uh, to Cuba on their passport? Um, Americans, according to U.S. law, uh, cannot travel to Cuba unless they meet certain criteria. Uh, the Cubans have never put any obligations. Right. Uh, they're delighted to have American tourists and American dollars uh, coming to Cuba. Um, uh, the, the actual the categories as a journalist, as a cultural figure, family reunification, uh, every year the, the, they're getting m uh, more increasingly, increasingly looser. 
Um, so this year, for instance, it's estimated that maybe 200,000 uh, U.S. citizens, mostly legal, others illegally through Cancun, Barbados, and Toronto, right. also go down. So it is evolving. Yeah. We're going to take a short break right now and be back with my guest, John Kirk, right after this. Welcome back to Off the Page. My guest is John Kirk. We're talking about Cuba right now. Um, I still remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. I grew up in the United States, and it was a very significant hi historical event. It sent a kind of you know chill through my generation. Take us back to that time and place. What happened? 1959, the Castro Revolution is successful. Uh, the American government thought that they could uh, basically woo the, the Castro government. Didn't work out. April 59, Fidel Castro goes to the United States. Dwight Eisenhower refuses to see him and goes golfing. He's met by Vice President Richard Nixon. Nixon, in his memoir, says after that meeting, this is April 59, that this man was dangerous uh, and needed to be eliminated. So the recommendation comes to the CIA, assassinate Castro. So between 59 and 61, tensions mount. Um, 1961, April 61, the Bay of Pigs invasion, the United States uh, recruits 1,400 Cuban exiles, trains them, equips them, pays them, and transports them. It's, it's a disaster from the U.S. perspective. Uh, from then, it's very obvious that the Castro government, to survive, has to take out an insurance policy. Uh, 90 miles away, the United States and John Kennedy, uh, very upset. He inherited the Bay of Pigs invasion plan from Eisenhower, getting all sorts of pressure. So the Cubans decide that, that, that the insurance policy has got to be big. The Soviets are looking for valuable real estate 90 miles away from their Cold War enemy. Uh, Cuba provides that. So the Soviets uh, uh, offer to the Cubans the, the, uh, the missiles. The Cubans accept them. Um, and then we see uh, the, uh, the Soviets and the Americans going eyeball to eyeball as to what happens with the, uh, with the missiles. So and the, the Americans Cuba already had missiles, basically, on the Soviet border. Sure, in, in Turkey. Turkey. Absolutely. Yeah. So in many ways, it was a double standard because, as you say, they, they, had, they had missiles. This was supposed, to the, from the Soviet perspective, to level the playing field. Um, in the end, Cuba was the, was the patsy. Cuba was the person in the middle who nobody consulted, and it became the two superpowers uh, sort of struggling against each other. Even as a, as a kid, I forget how old I was, but I was pretty darn young, I was pretty aware of the fact that this was very close to the, the big nuclear war. Oh, absolutely. Just uh, very happen. Very scary. Very scary. I, I was a kid of 11 years of age in, in Liverpool in England, and I remember very clearly, too. Yeah. Who blinked? Uh, well, the, the Soviets, uh, in, in the end, uh, Khrushchev said, no, no, this, this, is, this is crazy. Yeah. Um, thank God for that, otherwise... Well, that's right. No, I, I, re, I rethought that whole process after a while, and I was talking to my class once about the fact that, you know, we're probably all here today because of Nikita Khrushchev. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not necessarily Kennedy. Um, this, this great chasm that exists between the United States and Cuba, do you see that being resolved in the next uh, five, ten years? No. Uh, I, I wish it were, because common sense should dictate that uh, the United States policy has failed miserably. Uh, George W. Bush is the 10th U.S. president, 10th, vowing to set foot in a democratic, independent Cuba. Um, I coach my daughter's soccer team, and if I'd played the same team and lost 10, 10 times in a row, I, I'd change the game plan. Uh, the United States hasn't, uh, and I think that... Uh, uh, also, an, another important statistic, every year the United Nations, Cuba brings forward a, mess, uh, a motion to the UN General Assembly every November condemning the, um, uh, the blockade. Uh, 167 countries uh, voted uh, uh, to support Cuba against three. Uh, so um, it's, it's very obvious that the international community would like common sense to prevail. Under the Bush government, I don't see that, I, I don't see that happening at all. And there's real economic hardship that still exists in Cuba as a result of the way that the United States uh, controls that economic blockade? I think that, well, I think that both because of that and because the, so the Cuban government or the Cuban society had been too dependent upon the Soviet Union, the end result is that yes, there is, there is hardship. Um, I think that the worst period was 1992, 1993. Uh, Cubans, if you look at life expectancy, look at literacy, look at infant mortality, look at all the normal socioeconomic indices, uh, to, uh, from the point of view of quality of life, and Cuba is at the top of the league table in Latin America. 
Um, nevertheless, people, I think, are, there's a big chasm between those with dollars and those without dollars. Um, this is a new policy introduced by the Castro government in, the in 1993, basically as a means of, of having the revolution survive after the Soviet Union uh, uh, pulled the, the rug from underneath them. Yes. Let's uh, shift countries for just a minute, go further down sure. to Central America. You've written about Nicaragua as well, the yes. relationship between the church and uh, the state there. Um, liberation theology, what is that all about? Very simply, it, it's a, a belief that um, you practice the religion by uh, your daily life, and if you, whatever your religion, you in essence have to um, uh, to to, ha to develop a practical form of religion. Um, I, it is. It also has a, this essence of the preferential option for the poor. Uh, Jesus preferred to live not as a, as a, a scribe, not as a lawyer, but as the son of a carpenter. Um, and I think that that's what, uh, that again is an important uh, aspect of liberation theology. What became of the Sandinista Revolution? The Sandinista Revolution uh, was voted out in 1990. Uh, the, the 1979, the Sandinistas took over. Uh, they had two major elections, 1994, which they won, and the year 2000. The United States went out of its way to destroy the Sandinista Revolution uh, because it was a very, it was a unique model. It was, it was a Christian model, it was a Marxist model, and it was a nationalist model. There were four Catholic priests who were members of the cabinet, the Minister of Education, the Minister of Culture, uh, the, the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Social Welfare were all Catholic priests. Um, and to have a Marxist, Catholic, nationalist mixture, volatile mixture in, in, in Latin America where most, just over half the world's Catholics are in Latin America. So if this tiny little country of two and a half million people at the time was successful, would it have been successful, it would have sent a dramatic signal uh, around the world. Now the United States locked uh, in a war with the, uh, the Cold War with the, United, with the Soviet Union couldn't allow a dangerous example um, uh, of such a tiny country within its sphere of influ influence. So as a result, the Contra War was started and funded. Uh, this, the, uh, by the end of the Sandinista years, by 1989, 1990, 70% of the, the national budget was being spent on defense. Um, and people wanted an end to the war. And uh, without the, the U.S. backing, the war, uh, uh, well, the, the U.S. war, the, the war depended upon the United States. It's interesting to hear you speak about some of these things and realize that we're um, still living so much in the, the fallout from the Cold War. Absolutely. Even many years after that. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take one final short break here, and we'll be back with my guest John Kirk right after this. <laughs> My guest today has been John Kirk. We're talking about Central America and about Cuba in particular. Uh, this tourism business in Cuba, I guess that's a double-edged sword. Brings in lots of money and that's good, but... Well, the flip side is that you've got people who uh, are, are uh, causing the, the culture, the, the, the way culture in the broader sense of the term, to change. Because um, in, Cu in Cuba now, tourism for the past three years has brought in more money than sugar. It's the main hard, hard currency earner. Yes. Uh, but people have had to change in order to, uh, to, to, to meet the, the demands. And two million people coming into Cuba, uh, that's ten times the number of tourists that there were a decade ago. And society in Cuba is changing very slowly, but definitely changing as a result of it. Drugs and prostitution has that become some drugs the was prostitution and major crackdown on sex tourism, and, and that, fortunately that's improved. But uh, and, and drugs has never been a real problem the way it has been in other countries. But yes, society has changed. And I, Does that tourism too make um, people within a culture feel a little more subservient somehow? In most places, it will it will do. In the Cuban culture, probably not, because Cubans are any, anything but subservient. Um, but yes, it, it makes means that they have to adapt in the real world, and uh, them's the breaks. John, thanks for coming today, and thanks for watching the show. Uh, you've been watching Off the Page. I'll see you again next time. Mm -hmm.